Hi everyone, welcome to Bread and Roses. I hope you're fine. I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bouspouya. In this week's program, we're going to be speaking about hostage taking of the Islamic regime of Iran and the various ways it's done this over four decades of its rule. Um, interview this week is actually a speech by Pregna Patel, the director of Sahel Black Sisters uh, at last year's uh, Secularism Conference. Stay with us, Dongo. <laughs> Hostage taking has been an integral pillar of the Islamic regime of Iran's rule and it's something that's been going on for over 40 years. We know very often when we hear about it in the news, uh, especially more recently, it's about the hostage taking of dual nationals, you know, those who are British Iranian, American Iranian and so on. However, the reality is that this has always been a pillar of its rule inside Iran especially. So it started with hostage taking of uh, American embassy officials for example when it was uh, just trying to get into power and since then uh, we see how it's been used to put pressure on political prisoners families as well as on activists both within Iran and outside of Iran as a way of trying to silence any sort of um, uh, pressure and account and demands of accountability of this regime and its repressive measures. Uh, you see that in the last 40 years there have never been a moment in the Islamic regime that they won't have hostages of foreign nationals. We've always had that in Iran, always been used as a tool to pressure um, uh, foreign nationals to advance its uh, terrorist policies really abroad the Islamic regime by the same time has been a means of income, uh, um, always uh, alongside putting political pressure or diplomatic pressure um, to achieve its aim, there's always been monetary um, aspect to uh, the hostage taking, be it uh, hostages who were taken in Lebanon, uh, in Iran, in the borders, or neighboring countries, they've always taken hostages to advance uh, uh, the, the aims, but always a monetary element on the side. But this has not only been part of and parcel of its uh, foreign policy, it's been part of its internal repressive measures. Political prisoners uh, always have to uh, put some money down uh, as, uh, as part of bail, but they actually don't get released very quickly, they'll be taken in, and uh, the whole judiciary system of the Islamic regime has been funded through huge amount of money that they've confiscated from uh, prisoners and the families, and that, that's, that's been exposed so many times. Uh, even rivals within the Islamic regime exposing the, pre the, the predecessors, how much money they've taken, uh, how much resources they've taken. The previous uh, head of judiciary in Iran had you know, tens of accounts with millions and millions uh, um, uh, of uh, pounds and dollars of money in it, and, and amount of assets in those accounts just mind-boggling how much money they've, they've, they've taken away and that's part of it's been a business for them yeah and of course uh, as a business for example it uh, has um, you know it's it's well known that it uses uh, um, financial pressures on uh, political prisoners and their families. So, for example, uh, we know that in a prison in Zahedan, they're even charging prisoners for water and electricity in, that's being used in the cells. And in the 80s, during the bloody decades, we know, for example, that families were told to pay for the bullets uh, that were used uh, to execute their sons and daughters and, and family members. So it's always had this sort of financial gain from uh, the sort of hostage taking. And it, it, it reminds me of the uh, prison system uh, uh, pre-reform in the um, 18th and 19th century of Britain. Uh, the prison guards uh, and uh, prison wardens actually were running business from the prisons and they would uh, collect rents from people who were in prison, the families could come and live with them. It was a business, so they wouldn't let prisoners easily off the hook because they were a source of income. And that's what it is. Hostage taking and prisoners in Iran are a source of income for the Islamic regime, a corrupt government. But at the same time, it, ha it is a means of putting pressure on dissenters. Uh, there are everybody who is political activists, it doesn't matter whether they're in, they, they're, uh, 
the, the, the work in Iran, the art in Iran or abroad, they always had the families of the uh, um, activists under pressure and they've taken him, they've taken him for questioning, they've taken him uh, effectively hostage to silence opponents. Now this hostage taking, as I said, is not just a question of dual nationals. That's what we often hear about in the news. But for example, Atene Daimi, who's a children's rights activist, an activist against the death penalty, she had her two sisters taken hostage and imprisoned because of her activities. You've got Nasrin Sutude, who's a human rights lawyer. Again, her husband has been arrested and actually given a long-term prison sentence as well. You have someone like Sohail Arabi, who's wanted for uh, effectively blasphemy charges, who again, his mother has been taken in prison. And a lot of this is in order to silence family members from criticizing uh, the treatment and torture of their loved ones. You've got uh, someone like uh, Yasaman Aryani, uh, a woman who uh, went and uh, challenged compulsory veiling laws, her mother Monira Arab Shahi was arrested, uh, you know, um, and also imprisoned and she along with uh, another women's rights activist have been sentenced to 55 years in prison. So this is really something that's part and parcel of, of its rule and it's not recent as we've said. You know, if you look at the bloody decade of the 80s, for example, where thousands of prisoners were killed, uh, some would even say tens of thousands of prisoners were killed, many of them buried in unmarked graves. The mothers of those uh, who were killed, for example, the mothers of Khabaran, have often been threatened, intimidated, beaten, um, arrested, uh, because they are trying to uh, demand accountability for all of those who were killed, and you know their whereabouts are still not known. Hostage taking has always been part and parcel of the Islamic regime. It's part of its corrupt operation. And in reality, it reflects a society of 80 million people who are, they, they've taken hostage for the, you know, to, for the aim. And that's, you could see that what's happening in prison, what's happening in the judiciary of system, it reflects the society and the relationship that they've actually created in Iran. 80 million people are hostage to the Islamic regime. And when actually, when they arrest them and bring them into prison, they treat them exactly the same. They, they, they take the families, as far as they're concerned, everybody is game. It doesn't matter whether your friend, relative, family, lawyers, so many lawyers have been arrested in Iran for defending uh, uh, labor activists for defend, defending human rights um, uh, activists, immediately they're taken in and they're in prison uh, themselves. They're actually, they're taking hostage people for, to, to stop them to complain, uh, to stop them to uh, oppose the oppressive rule of the Islamic regime. And this situation will only end. Hostage shaking is not going to end uh, until the Islamic regime of Iran is in power. I mean, the thing is that you can see very clearly that it is part and parcel of Islamic rule, Sharia rule, theocratic rule, uh, because it is a, a legal system that is really so unjust. It's based on tribalism. It's brace, based on an eye for an eye sort of, um, uh, you know, philosophy. It's not based on justice, and that's why it's routine for the regime to harass and. Um, uh, intimidate uh, family members, arrest them uh, uh, as well. And again, this is to harass, to silence um, activists within Iran, as well as, of course, activists abroad. All of us who are active abroad have faced threats from the regime, as well as had our family members uh, face pressure, uh, interrogations, intimidations. It's just routine. You know, and it's, I think, unique to at least the Islamic regime is one of the very few countries in the world which actually uses hostage taking as part of its legal system. It's outrageous. There is no excuse for it. And I think what is important is that people very clearly unite and say that hostage taking is unjust and also to say that this system, that a legal system based on uh, Islam, on any religious uh, 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 rule, is unjust and cannot be acceptable in the 21st century.
wish I wasn't doing this because people have said things far better than I could have said, and they are, and they have uh, been fantastic. The women before me. I'm so sorry that you're going to have to tolerate me for a bit longer. I'm sorry that I'm going to have to tolerate me for a bit longer. Um, it's an honour. It is an honour to make some closing remarks to end today's remarkable conference. I want to start by talking about a recent event in London where the renowned author John le Carre said of our times, something truly seriously bad is happening and we have to be awake to that. These stages that Trump is going through in the United States and the stirring of racial hatred a kind of burning of the books as he attacks, as he declares real news as fake news. The law becomes fake news. Everything becomes fake news. I think of all these things that were happening across Europe in the 1930s, in Spain, in Japan, obviously in Germany. To me, these are absolutely comparable signs of the rise of fascism and it's contagious, it's infectious. Fascism is up and running in Poland and Hungary. This is me. I can't help but agree with his view. People here have spoken and borne witness, all the speakers here have borne witness to these and other appalling events and atrocities brought about by the neoliberal political order the erosion of democratic institutions, including the rule of law, and the rise of religious and far-right authoritarianism. I don't think I'm alone in feeling that we are on the brink of an era of fascism, not only in Europe, but also around the world. Events across Europe, India, Turkey, Pakistan, the US, even Brazil and elsewhere, show that there is a darker, more sinister politics of hatred, intolerance, and violence at play. Violence aimed at silencing dissent is in danger of becoming the, modern, the, the dominant mode of communication. Such violence is driven by fear of the other and holds sway as governments themselves become implicit in, if not drivers, of this new regressive and chilling politics of terror and censorship. We are witness to a worldwide onslaught on citizenship rights and human rights, a rejection of secular democratic values that were established in the aftermath of the Second World War when, as Gita outlined in her opening address, a new world order arose out of the wreckage of the old decrepit systems of authoritarian governance. That new order was underpinned by secular values that were integral to struggles against colonialism and for democracy, and are more recently integral to anti-racist and anti-imperialist struggles across the world. Religious fundamentalism and ultra-conservatism that together I refer to as the religious right, as well as anti-immigration, xenophobic, and racist discourses and practices are becoming normalized. What they have in common is an anti-elite, anti-cosmopolitan, anti-intellectual, and a regressive nationalist thrust. These developments have elements of classic fascism, but they are new forms too, especially with the advent of social media and technological advances in communication. They are accompanied by the triumph of austerity, unbridled free market capitalism and neoliberalism, and the destruction of the environment. All of which, when combined, create lethal spaces in which patriarchal and racial violence, ethnic and religious cleansing, intolerance, hatred, inequality, and bigotry flourish. So what do I take away from today? I have seen and learned that each person here is engaged in a political struggle for secular democracy, 
Some have battled courageously to uphold key principles of democ democracy, constitutionalism, and the universality of human rights. They have maintained the utmost dignity in the face of horror and brutality. Others have attempted to carve out alternative democratic social structures and ways of being in the face of fear and intimidation and the threat to life itself. What this tells me is that the very idea of dissent is vital to a secular demo democracy. Protecting the right to dissent without fear of intimidation, violence, and retribution is central to the democratic process and governance. The absence of disagreement, difference, and dissent is totalitarianism, despotism, and tyranny. I'm no stranger to the concept of dissent. South or Black Sisters' very inception was an act of dissent because we set ourselves not only against traditionalists and conservatives who sought to suppress women in our communities, but also against anti-racist and feminist orthodoxies of the day that lapsed into narrow and essentialist identity politics. By dissenting, we were not only breaking the silence on so many fronts, but also laying the foundations of a politics of resistance that involved facing many directions at once. Next year is the 30th anniversary of the fatwa against Salman Rushdie. 30 years ago, in response to the unprecedented frenzy surrounding the publication of the Satanic Verses, Women Against Fundamentalism was founded by South All Black Sisters and others. Our first act was an act of defiance against Muslim fundamentalism, fundamentalists who called for the death of Salman Rushdie as a blasphemer. The significance of what is now an iconic Women Against Fundamentalism moment of protest in Parliament Square is that, along with other feminists, we drew connections between Rushdie's right to dissent and the feminist tradition of dissenting. Doubting and dissenting lies at the heart of the feminist movement. It most certainly lies at the heart of SBS's brand of feminism, which sees dissent as a necessary means of achieving gender equality and the progressive transformation of society more, gen more generally. Dissent is vital if we are to create a strong and vibrant democracy. But we have to distinguish between those who dissent in order to improve democracy, participation, and governance. In other words, dissent with an ethical content, and those who seek to undermine the very basis of the democratic process. Is this, under, is this distinction understood well enough? At the time of writing this, I couldn't help but think about the contents of a wonderful letter that Salman Rushdie wrote at the time of the fatwa to the now deceased black MP Bernie Grant, whose view on the whole affair was emblematic of all that was wrong with many on the anti-racist left, many of whom remained silent or defended fundamentalist demands that included extending blasphemy laws and for greater accommodation of religion in the state apparatus on the grounds that the so-called Muslim community needed protection from demonization and racism. In the course of his reply, Rushdie made what I consider to be one of the finest arguments in defense of the centrality of dissent to democratic values. He said, Dear Bernie Grant, Burning books, you said, in the House of Commons exactly one day after the fatwa is not a big issue for blacks. You represent, sir, the unacceptable face of multiculturalism, its deformation into an ideology of cultural relativism. Cultural relativism is the death of ethical thought, supporting the right of tyrannical priests to tyrannize, of despotic parents to mutilate their daughters, of bigoted individuals to hate homosexuals and Jews because it is part of their culture to do so. Bigotry, prejudice, and violence, or the threat of violence, are not human values. They are the proof, they are the proof of the absence of such values. They are not the manifestations of a person's culture. They are indications of a person's lack of culture. 
In such crucial matters, sir, to quote the great monochrome philosopher Michael Jackson, it don't matter if you're black or white. I love that. I absolutely love that. Wish I'd written it. Undoubtedly, there are parallels between religious fundamentalism and fascism. Both are authoritarian political ideologies and movements that cash in on disaffection and mobilize racist or religious discourses to gain or consolidate power over people and resources. The fascist leaders of the far-right movements in Europe denounce multiculturalism, immigrants, and Muslims, whilst religious fundamentalists denounce so-called Western values, feminism, religious minorities, and those who do not subscribe to their authoritarian and austere worldviews. Both reject modernity whilst themselves using very modern technologies, and both seek a return to an imaginary utopian religious or nationalist past based on a perceived crisis of morality. Both rely on violence, fear, and hatred as key weapons of control and annihilation. Both are communalizing forces that deny and deride our shared common humanity and values of diversity, pluralism, tolerance, compassion, and individual freedom, and instead pursue a politics of division, ethnic or religious cleansing, and of course, genocide. Fascism is problematic in whatever guise it appears. So we cannot afford to create a hierarchy of fascism. The idea that the far right is more dangerous than the religious right, or for instance, that US nationalism is more sinister than Turkish nationalism, is a fallacy. The danger is self-evident since all forms of fascism seek to retreat from democratic and human rights laws, principles, and standards. Disturbingly, these authoritarian tendencies have moved into the public space where they have either been incorporated into mainstream politics or have become part of social movements where they have given fascism an anti-imperialist, anti-racist, and even a feminist face. What results is the creation of a regressive form of re resistance and identity politics tied to cultural relativism, neo-patriarchy, and anti-racism, in which the non-existent right not to be offended by dissenting voices, particularly minority secular voices, is elevated into a sacrosanct principle. The consequential assault on free speech, mobilized around the dubious politics of causing offense by the left, as much as by the right, has become, and I quote, the cutting edge of tyranny. And it is being played out in a range of local, national, and international contexts. It is time to change, challenge the fallacy that left automatically means progressive. If the left cannot defend, <laughs> if the left cannot defend secular histories, spaces, and principles, including the right to free speech and to, devent, to dissent and subvert, all of which, which is the lifeblood of any meaningful democracy, then does it even deserve to be called the left? Yeah. So what is to be done? Well, this room is full of examples of what is to be done what can be done, and what must be done. In this era of post-truth and pre-fascism, I am once again drawn to the teachings of Gandhi. The historian Faisal Devji has said that he, Gandhi, spoke of protecting truth at the cost of life, and made its very sacrifice the essence of nonviolence. In this hall today, we have seen some truly courageous examples of struggles based exactly on the principle of the sanctity of truth and the importance of speaking truth to power. 
But we need to be aware that fundamentalism is not the only threat to secular, plural democracy. The use of majoritarianism to promote a secular, a vision of secularism that is imbued with racist, nationalist, and far-right imperatives is as problematic as is the rise of religious fundamentalism or the religious right. We also need to address the relationship between the rise of authoritarianism and the neoliberal economic order and its attack on the rights of citizens to housing, education, health, employment, welfare support, protection, and justice. I have never seen, I have seen the havoc that has, this has wrought in my own work at Southall Black Sisters. The collapse of the welfare state and the privatization of public education and the law have encouraged the spread of religious fundamentalism and the depoliticization of NGOs. Drawing inspiration from the thousands of ordinary people standing up to authoritarian and fundamentalist forces and standing for secular principles around the globe, we must utilize all the cultural, social, legal, and political spaces at our disposal, as we have done in the UK with varying degrees of success. Our work in South All Black Sisters, One Law for All, Women Against Fundamentalism, and Feminist Dissent are examples of how we are challenging religious fundamentalism in the UK in an interrelated and multidimensional way whilst facing many directions at the same time. We need to renew our commitment to rejecting the politics of fear, hatred, and violence, and to safeguard secular democratic spaces, spaces that protect the ideas of unity and diversity based on, common, on our common huma humanity and the principles of the universality and the non-divisibility of human rights. We must do so without abdicating moral responsibility and in solidarity with those who dare, up, who dare to speak up for the ideals of secular democracy and all that goes with it. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.